This video was made possible by Tab for a Cause. Take a second to install the Chrome extension Tab for a Cause. It's completely free. And every time you open up a new tab in your browser, a small donation is made to a charity of your choosing. So far, Tab for a Cause has raised over half a million dollars. So let's keep that number growing. You're feeding children, protecting the rainforest, and more, while all essentially doing nothing. Use the first link in the description and start raising money for charity while you surf the web. The Black Keys appeared to come out of nowhere in 2010 with tracks like Tighten Up, Tighten up on your rings, you're wild. and Howlin' For You. Baby, I'm howling for you. Yeah. Their album Brothers saw their blues rock sound appeal to larger audiences, and finally, after nearly a decade and five albums later, it was well deserved and perhaps overdue. The success of Brothers resulted in extensive touring and promo events, and the boys still delivered a quicker and catchier effort with El Camino just a short year later. Even with rock at quite possibly its lowest commercial state, the Black Keys released two Smash albums at once, and then in 2014 the pair returned with Turn Blue, scoring their first ever number one selling record. The group had spent so many years as an underground act, but when they finally achieved mainstream success and were quite possibly at the peak of their musical careers, they vanished. Which begs the question, what happened to the Black Keys? Hailing from the rubber city, Akron, Ohio, the Black Keys are Dan Auerbach and Patrick Carney. The two grew up in the same neighborhood, but were from different cliques growing up. Dan was high school cool, captain of his school soccer team, and listened to hip hop and old school blues. Patrick was more of a class clown, a social outcast who adored Vanilla Ice and Led Zeppelin. Both were obsessed with music from a young age, and it was music that would eventually bring the two together when their older brothers suggested they have a jam session. And they eventually would, in Patrick's makeshift basement studio. Dan was the better guitarist of the two, which put Patrick on drums. Sadly, the two ended up going off to college and losing track of one another before anything really transpired. That was until they both dropped out. Patrick started working any job he could to make rent, while Dan realized music was what he really wanted to pursue and began playing at local gigs, attempting to make a living. He soon realized he needed a demo if he wanted to start booking gigs outside of his hometown. So he asked his old pal Patrick if him and his bar band could record a session in his basement. On the day Dan was meant to record, his two other bandmates didn't show. So just like old times, Pat jumped on the drums and the duo were making music immediately. And the Black Keys were born that day. They created a six song demo of old blues ripoffs and mailed them out to several labels. Indie label Alive ended up offering them a record deal before they even played their first show as the Black Keys. The boys were just happy to make a record and that someone was willing to put out their music. They quickly got to work recording and self-producing their debut, The Big Come Up. They reworked old blues riffs while focusing on groove, drawing inspiration for a Muddy Waters, Helen Wolf, and R.L. Burnside. Recorded in Patrick's basement, it was lo-fi, or as the group dubbed it, medium fidelity. They would play their first show in Cleveland to eight people, half of those being friends and family, and they were only paid 10 bucks for the show. After getting some press coverage, including a four-star review in Rolling Stone magazine, they quickly gained a small cult following, but also began drawing comparisons to another two-piece garage rock band from the US with a color in their name. A feud Jack White has since taken personally, but that's a story for another time. The Keys' debut caught the attention of Fat Possum Records, who would distribute their next two albums, beginning with Thick Freakness. I'm gonna set you free. The album was recorded in a single 14-hour session back in Patrick's basement. It was their only option after spending their signing bonus on rent. They returned with more of their natural blues, Dan's soulful vocals a little more pronounced, and clearer production all around. And it helped open up a few doors. Despite touring in a 90s Chrysler van like the one that would later appear on the cover of El Camino, they were opening for acts like Sleater Kinney, Beck, and Dashboard Confessional, all helping them garner new fans along the way, but the incessant touring left them drained and exhausted. They returned home and the two spent a few weeks apart recovering. Two weeks later, they were ready to record a new album. Patrick's basement had been sold by its landlord, so they needed a new place to make noise, and they set up shop in what used to be a tire factory for the aptly titled Rubber Factory. You got pain, The year before, they had turned down a $300,000 licensing opportunity for a mayonnaise ad. They were afraid of being called sellouts by their fans, but the Black Keys still weren't getting much radio play. They thought no one was buying or hearing their music. 
So when Nissan eventually approached them to license the song, they said screw it and started licensing their music where they could. They needed to make money, and guess what? The fans didn't mind. Rubber Factory was their first album to chart on the Billboard 200. They started playing large festivals like Coachella and Bonnaroo, and the added spotlight saw none such records scoop up the keys for their next effort, Magic Potion. The guys managed to return back to Patrick's old basement to record their first album made up entirely of their own original material. You see, their past albums always contained at least a few covers. This was the first time they decided to leave them behind. They paid $350 to get the record mastered, but were disappointed with the final product. But rather than spend more time or money on the record, the Keys just mailed in what they had. Magic Potion still remains the Keys' most critically panned album, and whether that was due to the less than stellar mixing or lackluster track listing, they'd learn their lesson and for the first time headed into a professional studio to record Attack and Release. Hip-hop producer Brian Burton, better known as Danger Mouse, was working on a comeback album with blues legend Ike Turner and asked the Black Keys to write a few tracks. But when the album was shelved due to Turner's passing, the Black Keys decided to rework those tracks they created into Black Keys tracks with Danger Mouse as producer. Here we saw the group's cleanest sounding album yet. This also marked the beginning of their relationship with Danger Mouse, who would be quintessential in the Black Keys' future success. 2009 would prove to be a challenging year for the Black Keys. Shortly following attack and release, Dan put out his first solo effort, Keep It Hit. Patrick felt betrayed, thinking Dan was moving on, but that could have been due to Patrick being in a dark place, in an unhealthy relationship where his partner pit him against Dan. The rock duo had difficulties communicating because of it, and didn't speak for months. Pat started the indie band Drummer where he played bass, releasing the album Feel Good Together that same year. Patrick came to his senses, divorced his wife, and reconciled with Dan shortly after. They teamed up with Rockefeller co-founder Damon Dash to put together the project Black Rock, a rap rock album featuring the rock instrumentals of the keys and verses from artists like Moe's Def, Ludacris, Raekwon, and Old Dirty Bastard of the Wu-Tang Clan. After both venturing into side projects and later collaborating with new artists, the Black Keys were stronger than ever before. Brothers, if you will. The pair headed to a secluded studio in Alabama where they poured their previous year's frustrations into the emotionally raw Brothers. Up became the group's most successful single to date, and was the only track on the album produced by Danger Mouse. It earned them 10 weeks in the number one spot on the Alternative Songs chart, and things would never be the same. They took home three of the five Grammys they were nominated for, Brothers peaked at number three on the Billboard 200, it became the best-selling alternative album of 2010, eventually being certified platinum in the US and double platinum in Canada. They became their label's most licensed band of the year. If you heard Garage Rock anywhere in 2010, it was the Black Keys. Their tour numbers tripled, from playing venues with only about 2,500 people to upwards of 8,000. The two didn't want to overthink all of Brothers' success either, and not be able to produce something they felt was great. Almost cancelling an Australian leg of their tour, they ended up juggling their time between studio and shows in order to put together El Camino. Wanting to replicate the success that was Tighten Up, the Black Keys approached this new album as a trio, with Danger Mouse contributing to melody and arrangements for all 11 tracks. They were meticulous with every musical detail, creating strong hooks with a quicker pulse than Brothers. In all, they spent 41 days recording El Camino, the longest they had ever spent on a record, and their efforts were rewarded. El Camino outdid Brothers, critically and commercially. Debuting at number 2 on the Billboard 200, their single Lonely Boy landed on several charts across the globe, bringing rock and roll back to the airwaves. Their previous LPs even started to rechart due to El Camino's success. They won three more Grammys that year, including Best Rock Album, beating out Jack White's solo debut, and they played a number of festivals over the year and would start playing arenas now, including Madison Square Garden, which they sold out in 15 minutes. Call it what you will, luck, timing, sheer hard work, and years on the road. No one deserved it more than these two. Following their two breakout LPs, the Black Keys took some time to themselves. Dan would produce for artists like Lana Del Rey, The Growlers, and Ray LaMontagne, with Patrick producing Tennis's LP, Ritual in Repeat. In early 2013, the boys returned to studio for their next album, and things would literally turn blue.
Danger Mouse returned, and the three attacked this album in a similar fashion to El Camino, attempting to craft catchy singles. Patrick wanted to let the album breathe a little more, and feeling as though they were taking the easy road, they put their recording sessions on hold. After a short tour in South America, they planned to record again for two weeks, but Dan walked out after the first day back, defeated in trying to record a vocal take, but also distracted by his recent divorce. Upon returning to the studio four months later, Dan relied on these sessions as therapy, making Turn Blue their most autobiographical record yet, and instead of another album full of singles, this was meant to be more of an intimate and moody listen. While it critically didn't perform as well as their previous efforts, the psychedelic Turn Blue became the Black Keys' first number one record. They had finally topped that mountain, just beating out Michael Jackson's Escape that week. So I might have exaggerated a little earlier. The Black Keys didn't just vanish. The two had accomplished so much and decided to take an indefinite break, since they had worked their asses off for over 10 years. They explained that touring was an unhealthy way to live and that they would return as they don't really have any other job qualifications. Dan is a prolific songwriter who has a hard time appreciating what he's already accomplished though. He didn't take a break for long. He went on to start the garage rock band The Arcs and later released another solo LP in 2017. Pat says he's suffering from touring PTSD, so he's sticking to a producer role where he can, most notably producing for his wife, pop artist Michelle Branch. But he says he's excited for when the Keys make music next. As of now, there's no timeline for when the rock duo will reunite, but Dan says this break is one of the best things they could have done. He's learned so much over the last few years, and this might mean some exciting things for future Black Keys albums. That is, if they ever happen. We'll see. In time. Patrons, I love you. Thank you for the continued support. New things are definitely coming your way, so look out for that. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like rating. Subscribe to learn more about the music you love. And tell me, do you think we'll see the keys return anytime soon? Has Dan Arbach moved on? Let me know what you think in the comments below. And that's it for me. Thanks again for watching, and keep listening.